Hey, what's up guys? James here. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're feeling well. Today I wanted to make a video talking about this book again, Spinoza, uh, by Gilles Deleuze, um, which uh, is a wonderful book. It's one of his easier books to get through and to read. It's a quick read. And um, I'm going to read a little bit from the back cover to kind of situate us here. Uh, so this is a book Gilles Deleuze is writing about the philosopher Spinoza. So Spinoza's theoretical philosophy is one of the most radical attempts to construct a pure ontology. Now, ontology means the study of being. With a single infinite substance, and all beings as modes of being of this substance. This book, which presents Spinoza's main ideas in dictionary form, has as its subject the opposition between ethics, how to act, and morality and the link between ethical propositions and ontological propositions. So he's, he's essentially how we act determines and essentially how we are, uh, what we are. His ethics is an ethology rather than a moral science. Recent attention has been drawn to Spinoza by deep ecologists um, and this new reading of Spinoza by Deleuze lends itself to a radical ecological ethic. As Robert Hurley says in his introduction, Deleuze opens us to the idea that the elements of the different individuals we compose may be non-human with us, within us. One wonders finally whether man might be defined as a territory, a set of boundaries, a limit on existence. So this chapter that I'm going to read from, I'll do a little close reading, a few, few paragraphs, is t entitled Spinoza and Us. And it's really um, a wonderful chapter and it, it and why I'm reading this, uh, it's really, Spinoza seems like a multi-dimensional thinker, and he introduces us to um, the dimensions, in a sense, and how to, um, at least from how I'm referencing this information here, how to determine what um, a dimension is. He calls it a plane of eminence. Uh, plane, of, plane of eminence is uh, a dimension on which all bodies, all minds, and all individuals are situated. Right, so he's going away from categorizing bodies by their organs and their functions, genus and species, and he's categorizing beings more by how they affect one another and how they're comprised uh, of, um, of an infinite amount, in, infinite um, parts. So I'm going to start reading here and I'll interject a little bit with some commentary. So Spinoza and us. This phrase could mean many things, but among other things, it means us in the middle of Spinoza. To try to perceive and to understand Spinoza by way of the middle. Generally, one begins with the first principle of, philosopher, of a philosopher. But what counts is also the third, the fourth, and the fifth principle. Everyone knows the first principle of Spinoza, one substance for all the attributes. But we also know the third, fourth, and fifth principle, one nature for all bodies. One nature for all individuals, a nature that is, is, that is itself an individual varying in an infinite number of ways. What is involved, and this is important here, is no longer the affirmation of a single substance, but rather the laying out of a common plane of eminence. So plane of eminence, plane of eminence means dimension again, right? So, but rather laying out of a, of a common dimension on which all bodies, all minds, and all individuals are situated. This dimension is a plan, but not in the sense of a mental design, a project, or a program. It is a plan in the geometric sense, a section, an intersection, a diagram. Thus, to be in the middle of Spinoza is to be on this modal plane, or rather, to install oneself on this plane, which implies a mode of living, a way of life. What is this plane, and how does it one construct it? For at the same time, it is fully a plane of imminence, and yet, it has to be constructed if one is to live in a Spinozist manner. So again, he's introducing here the plane of imminence, uh, which is a dimension on which all bodies, all minds, and all individuals are situated. Now he's going to go into here how to define a body. Right, so how does the Spinoza define a body? A body of whatever kind is defined by Spinoza in two simultaneous ways. In the first place, a body, however small it may be, is composed of an infinite number of particles. It is the relations of motion and rest of speeds and slowness between particles that define a body, the individuality of a body. Secondly, a body affects other bodies or is affected by other bodies. It is this capacity for affecting and being affected 
that also defines a body and its individuality. These two proportions appear to be very simple. One is kinetic and the other is dynamic. But if one truly installs oneself in the midst of these propositions, if one lives them, things are much more complicated and one finds that one is a Spinozist before having even understood why. So here he's, he's defining an interesting way to define a body. Um, there's two, two ways to define a body. One is however small the body may be, it's composed of an infinite number of particles. And it's the relations of speed, motions, rest, speeds, and slowness between particles that define the body, uh, the individuality of the body. And secondly, it's how, yeah, what determines a body is, is its ability to affect and be affected by other bodies, other beings, in a sense, on the plane of eminence, on the dimension. So a dimension in a body is, is, is constructed by the, um, the body's composition of infinite number of particles and then the ability of that body to affect and be affected by other beings in the environment. Um, so I'll continue here. Thus the kinetic proposition tells us that a body is defined by relations of motions and rest, of slowness and speeds between particles. That is, it is not defined by a form or by functions. Global form, specific form, and organic functions depend on relations of speed and slowness. Even the development of a form, uh, the course of development of a form depends on its relations and not the reverse. The important thing is to understand life, each living individuality, not as a form or a development of form, but as a complex relation between differential velocities, between deceleration and acceleration of particles. So again, what defines our body and our being is the movement, uh, the relative movement of slowness and speed of the particles that comprise our body. It also determines the relations of what we can have with other, um, other beings in, in, in the world that we exist in. A composition of speeds and slowness on a, on a dimension. He says plane of eminence, but I'm going to use the word dimension. In the same way, a musical form will depend on a complex relation between speeds and slowness of sound particles. It's not just a matter of music, but how to live. It is by speed and slowness that one slips in among things, that one connects with something else. One never commences, one never has a tabula rasa. One slips in, enters in the middle, one takes up or lays down rhythms. That's just a beautiful way of, of describing how we're always situated in a world, in a dimension. We're always in the middle of things when we're aware of, of who and what we are. And that's our starting point. We never start in a blank, with a blank slate. We're always starting in the midst of a world. The second proposition concerning bodies refers to the capacity for affecting and being affected. You will not define a body or a mind by its form, nor by its organs or functions, and neither will you define it as a substance or a subject. Every reader of Spinoza knows that for him, bodies and minds are not substances or subjects, but modes. It is not enough, however, to merely think this theoretically. For concretely, a mode is a complex relation of speed and slowness in the body, but also in thought. And it is a capacity for affecting or being affected, pertaining to the body or to the thought. Concretely, if you define bodies and thoughts as capacities for being affected, many things change. You will define an animal or a human being not by its form or its organs or its functions, and not as a subject either. You will define it by the effects of which it is capable. Effective capacity with a maximum threshold and a minimum threshold is a constant notion in Spinoza. Take any animal, any animal and make a list of its affects in any order. Children know how to do this. Uh, and he talks, uh, he makes an obscure example here. So for example, there are great, greater differences between a plow horse and a draft horse and a race horse than between an ox and a plow horse. This is because the race horse and the plow horse do not have the same affects nor the same capacity for being affected. The plow horse has affects in common with rather than an ox, rather an ox. So he's, seen, he's saying here that, you know, a, a race horse and a plow horse, the, they are, so a plow, a plow horse is, is more in common with an ox because even though an ox is a different animal, their ability to affect their affects, their, their, the mode in which they operate in uh, is, is similar whereas as opposed to a racehorse has further capacities and speeds. So it should be clear that the plane of eminence, the dimension, the 
plane of nature that distributes effects does not make any distinction at all between things that might be called natural and things that might be called artificial. Artifice is fully a part of nature since each thing on the imminent plane of nature is defined by the arrangements of motions and affects into which it enters, whether these arrangements are artificial or natural. Long after Spinoza, biologists and naturalists would try to describe animal worlds defined by affects and capacities for affecting and being affected. And this is a great example that he's, he's going to uh, give us here. Um, for example, J. von Euxkull will do this for the tick. So here's introducing the tick as an example. An animal that sucks the blood of mammals. He will define this animal by three affects. So a tick is defined uh, by these three affects, right? The first has to do with light climb on top of the branch, the tick timing on climbing on top of the branch. The second is olfactive, let yourself fall onto the mammal that passes beneath the branch. And the third is thermal, seek the area without fur, the warmest spot, a world with only three affects in the midst of all that goes on in the immense forest. So here's a great example of how we live in multiple dimensional reality all the time. All right, so a tick has three modes of existence that was described here, right? It can express and it can, and it can be, become itself through these three modes of existence. But that tick is embedded in a multi-dimensional reality, which is the forest, right? And you can make, take this example for each animal and kind of uh, identify the axis, axes on which it operates from, the affects, its ability to affect and be affected by other animals. And this is what determines that being rather than its functions and its, its organs and its, and its, uh, and its categories. Um, so an optimal threshold and a pessimal threshold in the capacity for being affected, the gorge tick that will die and the tick capable of fasting for a long time. Such studies that this which define bodies, animals, or humans by the effects that they are capable of founded what is today called ethology. The approach, the approach is no less valid for us, for human beings, than for animals because no one knows ahead of time the effects one is capable of. It is a long affair of experimentation requiring a lasting prudence, a Spinozian wisdom that implies the construction of a plane of eminence or consistency. That this, that, the wisdom that implies the construction of a dimension. Spinoza's ethics has nothing to do with the morality. He conceives it as an ethology that is the composition of fast and slow speeds, of capacities for affecting and being affected on this plane of eminence. That is why Spinoza calls out to us the way he does. You do not know beforehand what good or bad you are capable of. You do not know beforehand what a body or a mind can do in a given encounter, a given arrangement, a given combination. Ethology is first of all the study of the relations of speed and slowness, of the capacities for affecting and being affected that characterize each thing. For each thing, these relations and capacities have an amplitude, thresholds, maximums, and minimums, and variations or transformations that are peculiar to them. And they select in the world or in nature, that which corresponds to the thing, that is, they select which, what affects or is affected by the thing, what moves it or is moved by it. For example, given an animal that, what is this animal unaffected by in the infinite world? What does it react to positively or negatively? What are the nutriments and its poisons? What does it take in this world? Every point has its counterpoints, the plant and the rain, the spider and the fly. So an animal, a thing, is never separable from its relations with the world. The interior is only a selected exterior, and the exterior a projected interior. The speed or slowness of metabolisms, perceptions, actions, and reactions link together to constitute a particular individual in the world. So what determines what an individual is in its world? Right? It's, it's the speed or slowness of movement of metabolisms, perceptions, actions, and reactions linked together to constitute a particular individual in a world. Further, there is also the way in which these relations of speed and slowness are realized according to circumstances, and the way in which these capacities for being affected are filled. For they always are, but in different ways depending on whether the, pre the present affects threaten the thing, diminish its power, slow it, reduce it to the minimum, or strengthen it, accelerate it, increase it. Is it poison or food? With all the complications, since a poison can be food for part, uh, part of the thing considered. Lastly, ethology studies the composition of relations or capacities between things. This is another aspect of the matter, distinct from the preceding ones. 
Heretofore, it was only a question of knowing how a particular thing can de decompose other things by giving them a relation that is consistent with one of its own, or on the contrary, how it risks being decomposed uh, of, 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 in other things. But, how, but now it is a question of knowing whether the relations and which ones can compound directly to form a new, more extensive relation, relation or whether capacities can compound directly to constitute a more intense capacity or power. It is no longer a matter of utilizations or captures, but of sociabilities and communities. How do individuals enter into composition with one another uh, in order to form a higher individual ad infinitum? How can a being take another being into its world, but while preserving or respecting the other's own relations and world? And in this regard, what are the different types of sociabilities, for example? What is the difference between the society of human beings and the community of rational beings? Now we are concerned not with the relation of point to counterpoint, nor with the selection of a world, but with the symphony of nature, the composition of a world that is increasingly wide and intense. In what order and in what manner will the power, speeds, and slowness be composed? And I'll leave with this paragraph here. In short, if we are Spinozists, we will not define a thing by its form, nor by its organs and its functions, nor as a substance or a subject. Borrowing term from the Middle Ages or from geography, we will define it by longitude and latitude, a body can be anything. It can be an animal, a body of sounds, a mind, or an idea. It can be a linguistic corpus, a social body, a collective. We call longitude of a body the set of relations of speed and slowness, of motion and rest, between particles and com that compose it from this point of view, that is, between unformed elements. We call latitude the set of affects that occupy a body at each moment, that is, the in intensive states of an anonymous force, force for existing, capacity for being affected. In this way we construct the map of a body. Longitude and latitudes together constitute nature, the plane of eminence or consistency, which is always variable and is constantly being altered, composed and recomposed by individuals and collectives. So I'll leave it there. Um, I think this is, a, yeah, I haven't read through this in a while and I was kind of inspired to make a video and discuss how uh, interesting these ideas uh, put forth and how relevant they are, I think, to, to a, a, you know, contemporary ontology um, of how we are and how we exist in a world and how we're always, uh, we're always situated in a world in a dimension. Um, that dimension is made up of um, bodies that are similar in a sense of the speeds and slowness of which they encounter each other. Uh, so you could think of multiple dimensions that are outside of our ability as human beings to affect and be affected, right? Um, we live in the third dimension, fourth dimension through time, and our thoughts and ideas, maybe they live in the fifth dimension, fourth dimension. So our ability to affect and be affected is governed by our central gravity of being situated in the third and fourth dimension. Um, which is interesting, and, and these ideas, I think, uh, begat a lot of other interesting ideas. So, thanks for listening here. I know this is a little bit dense material. Uh, it's more for my philosophy friends, but uh, I appreciate you for listening, and blessings to you.